Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about how I kind of got into using Nextflow and how we use it at, at GMI. Um, good, my clicker works. It's a good start. Uh, so, we're sequencing, um, uh, aiming to sequence about 10% of the Irish population, and we're, you know, kind of steaming along towards that goal at the moment. So, we're doing 30x whole genome sequencing, and we're doing it across multiple disease areas. Um, so, we have oncology, um, at the moment, mainly on brain tumours and colorectal cancer. Um, we have autoimmune diseases. Um, so just Crohn's disease, um, neurology, uh, we have just controls and mainly controls for our GWAS kind of studies, uh, cardiovascular, and we do rare diseases as well where we work with uh, children's hospitals in Ireland um, who have, you know, children who've gone through genetic testing but maybe have kind of kept getting negative results back, we just do whole genome sequencing of them and we have a team that work on exclusively on that as well. Uh, so we collect multiple different types of samples uh, with blood, plasma, sputum tissue and tumour. Uh, mainly we're focused on whole genome sequencing at the moment. We've done some RNA sequencing for some of our cancer samples. Um, and in the future we're kind of hoping to get into microbiome analysis and metabolomics. But we have a lot to keep us busy at the moment. So we've uh, just opened a genomics centre this year. Um, so it's 10,000 square feet, uh, high volume sequencing. And we currently have five NovaSeqs and one gridiron. Um, and we just got CAP accredited there literally two weeks ago. Um, so it's College of American Pathologists accredited. Um, so I guess our kind of how data kind of comes in and moves through the lab is we get our DNA or RNA. Um, for DNA, we will do actually genotyping first, and that's kind of a QC check that we can use. Uh, first of all, check DNA kind of quality at the start, and then later on to kind of check to make sure we haven't mixed up samples um, when we get the sequencing back. Um, so then there's a whole kind of suite of data QC that they do in the lab, and then it goes on to next generation sequencer. Um, so mainly NovaSeq at the moment, we use Nanopore for kind of more research kind of applications. So we're doing a project on the Irish reference genome, kind of using Nanopore for stuff like that. And then we're doing, um, we have kind of biobanking capabilities as well. So we can biobank up to half a million samples. So in bioinformatics, uh, there's seven of us currently. Um, we develop pipelines to kind of everyday work and then more bespoke analysis. So I guess mainly we kind of work more on the kind of everyday, you know, stuff that will run itself where we aim to have it run itself. Um, and then as we kind of work closely with research um, and IT, if they need kind of more bespoke things, so research, you know, might need a GWAS or something kind of similar to that. So I guess, how did I get into Nextflow? Um, so when I was doing my PhD, I mainly used Bass scripts. Um, and I kind of came to GMI and, you know, we had lots of samples and I was kind of thinking this is not really going to work anymore. And when you talk to software developers, it's very embarrassing showing them a bash script. You know, you're going on about how great this pipeline is you developed and then you come up with this massive script and they're just looking at it. Um, so I kind of started um, also needing to, you know, process a lot of files at the same time and it became a pain to even try and think about doing that with bash. So I started looking at how I might do it in Python and then I started reading about workflow managers. Um, and I ended up trying Nextflow and I attended this hackathon last year and I did the course and that's kind of what got me, you know, kind of a bit more confident with Nextflow. Um, so I guess how, I, I guess why and how I chose Nextflow is actually a main one was the ability to kind of get off the ground fast. So when you look at the documentation, you can see the, you know, introduction, you can see, okay, I could probably write a script in this pretty quickly. It's, you know, you can look at the bash part of it and think, okay, I know that part and then kind of see inputs, outputs. Um, it's nice and straightforward. It's easy to install. Um, so very minimal code changes needed, good documentation, um, very fast prototyping of a working pipeline, uh, parallelism, I'm kind of saying everything everyone else has said here already, so all the same reasons everyone else likes it, I like it. <laughs> um, so separate folders for each task or process is great as well to prevent overwriting, uh, logging and reporting. Um, the graphs, obviously great for showing people and also great for discovering stuff that, you know, you've made channels and actually haven't used them anywhere, um, which is kind of always embarrassing when you're like, oh, that doesn't go anywhere. Um, ability to tag processes, um, kind of seamless integration with Amazon, and then it's very satisfying when you see lots of submitted reports as well when you have something running, um, even if they come back and some of them fail later. <laughs> um, so I guess how I kind of started off with in GMI is I just took some scripts that I already had and I just parallelized them and actually just one machine and just, you know, started running lots of samples through them. Um, and then I started making Docker files, and that was kind of more triggered by frustration. I was trying uh, this CNV caller, and I, it wasn't on Conda, and I just literally spent about five hours trying to install it. Um, and I just didn't want to go through it again, especially if I switched machine or something. So I was like, okay, I want to learn Docker. <laughs> um, and then I implemented that CNV caller in uh, Nextflow and used the Docker, uh, the Docker image. 
Um, so also, I guess in GMI then, we kind of started coming up to, we started uh, sequencing and we needed to validate our sequencing pipeline. Um, and then we also wanted to go for CAP accreditation as well. So we already kind of had the secondary analysis part of the pipeline done from FASTQ to um, VCFs. Um, before CAP, uh, when they, you do the CAP proficiency test, they send you a sample, you sequence it, and then um, they have a list of variant sites that they want you to report, you know, what your changes are at these sites. Um, and obviously you don't want to be like looking through the VCF file doing this. Um, so what I ended up doing was just doing the annotation, um, wrote a little Nexo script, did, did the annotation in it, and a little Python script that pulls out the variant of interest. Um, and it, it was nice and automated, nice and reproducible. And then we did check them as well. Um, and then I guess kind of one of the biggest pipelines I've written is actually a pipeline for doing a QC check. Um, and it's for doing concordance. So this is where we take the genotyping data we did um, you know, when the data came into the lab and we take the sequencing data that we've finished um, and we compare them. And we just want to check that this is the same sample that we started out with so we haven't, you know, something hasn't gone wrong in the process. Um, so this, I guess, I kind of, this evolved and it kind of evolved with Nextflow, I guess, evolving as well. So I started using Conda for that um, and that, you know, was great. Nice kind of quick development because I don't have to worry about installing tools. I actually started using the NF Core um, as well then. Um, and also to kind of test configs. And I actually learned how to use the configs by kind of looking at NF Core. Um, it was really good, even though I didn't maybe intend to put this pipeline, you know, in the NF Core group, it was really great for just learning and having good standards and that kind of stuff. Um, so NF Core, yeah, one of the things I really like about it is kind of a proper layout of repository and templates. Um, it looks like you've done loads of work when your supervisor comes along and asks, you know, how's your pipeline going? You're extremely busy, you know, I've done an awful lot. <laughs> Um, so it comes with documentation as well, which is great, kind of makes you write your own documentation because you're like, oh, I don't have that in my pipeline, I better change that. Um, and then also separate config files as well, so I was kind of saying, kind of learned how to make my own there. Um, so the kind of pipelines that we have in Nextflow at the moment, we have a genotyping QC pipeline, uh, which is written by David, who's in the audience there. Uh, with concordance of genotyping and sequencing, uh, copy number variation calling, and VCF annotation pipeline. So yeah, I was actually um, kind of got into Conda actually before I started using Nextflow and that was actually from David trying to convince me even though I was strangely resistant at the start and I can't remember why now. Um, but I started using it when I was writing Python scripts and just to keep the environment file with them so if someone else wanted to use it they could, you know, get off the ground very fast with it. And then I saw the blog post on uh, Conda so I started trying it in Nextflow. Uh, so what I really like about it is that it's, you know, even faster development than before. I don't have to, you know, go to a website, download a tool and then spend time installing it, I just type it in Conda. Um, I get my Conda from Mini Conda tree. Um, yeah, I've kind of said that already. Um, so I guess just a quick overview of, for anyone who hasn't used it, how you would use it. So I generally just Google, you know, if I want BCF tools, Conda BCF tools, it will come up um, on the Conda page, and then this is how you would implement it over here in Nextflow, so just bio Conda BCF tools. And then, you know, if you want to make sure you're really reproducible, the version, um, of BCF tools and you want to add some other software into the Conda environment as well. So here, Python 3.6, you could just do it like that. Um, so generally, I kind of try to minimize the number of Conda environments I have when I'm writing a script. So I generally, we'll use the same, you know, for multiple processes and then only kind of switch to a different one if something is incompatible in the two. Um, and what I would generally do then is go and put them in a Conda config file at the end and just use profile to run profile Conda um, to actually run it. Um, so like this, so you know, for all my foo processes I'm going to use, uh, or my foo processes I'm going to use Python 2.7, and then for everything else I'm going to use Python 3.6 and BioPython. Um, so I guess, yeah, Conda is really nice, um, but I guess if you want to use something like Amazon Batch, whatever, you're going to have to use Docker. Um, so just then switching from Conda to Docker, again, is very straightforward. And again, I, the easiest way of actually learning to do that is by looking at NF Core and seeing the Docker files that are there that use the Conda environment file to make um, Docker. And that's how I kind of looked at this. So at the top here, I'm just creating my Conda environment, exporting my environment file, and then I'm making my Docker image from that down here. Um, so it's actually really quick, really straightforward. And you know, I kind of I kind of like how quick it is starting off with Conda for development and then just switching over to Docker um, when I need to. Something went a bit wrong there. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm going to talk about what I was going to talk about there. It's meant to be a skeleton, but it obviously didn't come up. Is things that have kind of tripped me up and, and slowed me down, I guess, when I was uh, doing it. So one is um, we actually have multiple buckets and keys. So Nextflow handles, you know, having one bucket really nicely. You just put in your Amazon uh, keys um, and your region and, you know, off it goes. 
But if you have multiple buckets and keys, which you know you would specify, for instance, using the Amazon client like this, um, it's kind of not that straightforward to do. So I guess obviously the obvious way of doing it is to just explicitly use the Amazon client in Nextflow um, to download the files. So uh, we actually, I guess, when I'm looking for stuff, we tend to have a big list of file paths that will be in a database somewhere. So I'm just going to read those generally into a CSV, and then I'll read the CSV into a channel in Nextflow. And then I will just use the profile. So if you know the, the bucket name is this, I will use this profile. If the bucket name is this, I'll use the other profile. Um, so that's kind of how it kind of got around it originally. Now I actually kind of use Python. Um, Bolo Tree Library is quite nice for that, and I just run the Python script within a Nextflow process. Again, reading in the CSV and just feeding it to that Python script. Um, and there's other benefits, I guess, of Bolo Tree as well. You can check storage classes. So, for instance, something's moved to long-term storage. You know, you're not going to start pulling it back out, um, or it's not going to give you an error if it can't pull it out. Um, another kind of thing, I guess, there as well is you know exposing your credentials to Docker. Um, so if you're using a, a Docker image um, for the next one, you, you know you have your multiple profiles, then you need some way to actually get your credentials file kind of available to it. And generally, you don't want to put it in the image because if you put the image online, then your credentials are going to go with it. Um, so it's it's not very secure. Or also, if you're using a public image, so one way is to just use these run options and expose your kind of credentials file to it, and then you just run away as normal. Uh, so actually, I think Luke mentioned this yesterday. This is not a Nexo thing; it's a Bash thing. Um, but it's something you know that again kind of actually caught me out for <laughs> a good while when I was trying to figure out what I had done wrong. Um, so you know, you have spaces in a file name. So first file no space, second file has a space. Um, then you you know have your nice script, nice Nexo script here, and then you run it and you get this error. Um, that basically because it's trying to look for you know dot text to text to. Um, so the, obviously the easiest way to get around this is just to put your um, uh, variables in quotes, essentially. Um, very simple solution, and I kind of now tend to be very liberal with my use of quotes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's one of those things that didn't come up in testing because I obviously I'm not going to make files with spaces in them because I you know don't hate myself. Um, but uh, you know it will come up generally at some point, so you need to be aware that someone somewhere has probably made a file with a space. Um, and then, yay, it runs when you put quotes. <laughs> um, so I guess another one then is kind of choosing channels. So just splitting a channel into two channels based on some sort of result. Um, so actually this, kind of going back to when I was talking about storage, so we actually were kind of cleaning up some of our stuff and I was running this pipeline and then some of the stuff had been moved into storage and it had stopped, you know, it would then stop because this file was in storage and I couldn't get it out. So I wanted to add a process that would check this. So you know, it checks, is it available to actually be pulled from S3? And if it is available, I want to send it to one channel. And if it's not available, I want to send it to another channel. And then anything that's not available, I basically just want to write out to a file and just say, you know, this wasn't available, so I didn't use them. Um, and that's I kind of came about, I guess, because people would be asking me, oh, you had you know, 20 files going in and only 15 came out. Um, you know, where did the rest go? And I might have multiple checks, and I'm not entirely sure where I lost them in the, in the pipeline. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the thing for that. Um, so this is an example here. You know, I have one, two, three, four, five in, and I'm checking if x is greater than three. It's true. If it's less, it's false. So I'm going to um, have two false, false, and then three trues. Um, so then I'm going to choose. I want to put all my trues into one channel, all my false into another, and this is very straightforward to do. Um, it's just like this. And then how I've kind of, I guess, I don't know if there's possibly a cleaner way of doing this, but how I've kind of done it is I just then send the false channel. So I read in the false channel into a process and kind of echo out the stuff into a file. And then I just collect all the fail files in another process. So I'm not sure if there's some way to just dump a channel into a file or something. Um, maybe Paolo can tell me. Um, but yeah, that's how I've currently kind of got around it. I know it works, so happy enough. Um, and then, yeah, that's the little process running. And that's me. So just want to thank uh, GMI and the bioinformatics team at GMI. Uh, Paolo for this amazing, amazing um, resource, the Nexo community, uh, Phil and everyone else who's involved in NF Core, um, Anna for answering some stupid travel questions I had, and then we're hiring bioinformaticians as well. Thanks a million. <laughs>